darkness had fallen fast upon the land, as it was just 4.45 p.m. now. The night was very cold, as frost grew on the buildings, as well as the shrubs around. The chilly winds were definitely big to be underestimated, as they rudely blew across the land. But even though the weather wasn't all that favorable, the empire was still as colorful and spirited as it usually was. Laughter, chatter, and sounds of vehicles filled the streets of Baymart. The streets were almost devoid of snow, and the people all had very warm attires on to fight the battle head-on. It was just past four, and there were still a lot of things to do within the bubbling empire. Hence for many, the night had come a little too soon for some people, as they wanted to gallant about the streets of Baymard gleefully. But for others, nighttime felt like the beginning of a chapter in their lives. Beep! All inmates should head on back to their cells for lockup in 30 minutes' time. I repeat, all inmates should head back to their cells for lockup. In Baymard's high-tech prison for males, within Sector A, an announcement rang out throughout the entire sector. All inmates had 30 more minutes to round up what they were doing before lockup. Some were doing laundry, while others focused on mopping the floors, or even doing light punishment that had been assigned to them earlier on. And apart from those, one should know that all prisoners had weekly tasks to complete while here, and sometimes, some people proffered to do those talks just before they slept instead, rather than waking up early and mopping the floors instead, or doing other chores. So after dinner, some people immediately did their chores like cleaning the floors, so that they could sleep in tomorrow for a bit, rather than waking up really early to do janitor duties. Highway could choose when to do their chores daily, provided it didn't delay the smooth running of the prison. Of course, while others were doing chores, some just chilled in their cells, as well as the cells of their friends instead. Because during the day, all cells were left open for inmates to bond with each other. Some were working out together by doing push-ups, while others were talking about their adventurous escapades out of Baymart. In short, the cells were left open during the daytime. But when it was time for lockup, all prisoners had to go back to their cells immediately. Once the announcement rang out, Tybalt and the rest calmly went back to their cells. Just before the announcement, they had made sure that they weren't seen together, so as not to look too suspicious to the guards. So they had been in different rooms or cells, found different things altogether. Tybalt reached his cell and nodded at his roommate before finally jumping onto the lower bunk bed. He placed his blanket over his head and waited for the next announcement. All cell doors will close in 3, 2, 1. Bam! The doors were all automatic and were easily controlled by the guards in the control room. Of course, even though the doors were automatic, there was still a keyhole on each door as a secondary precaution, just in case they couldn't open or close any of the doors. If the mechanism for a particular cell door is jammed or fails to work, then they would use the master key to do the job instead. There were times where prisoners would be late for lockup, and at that time, the guards would use the master key to open some of the cells and send the prisoners in. After lockup, all guards walked towards the exit door for the prisoners' sleeping quarters and just stood there. Of course, they were waiting for the last announcement of the day. It's 11 p.m. on the day. Now, it's time for lights out. With that, all lights within the prisoners' sleeping quarters went off automatically, followed by a massive bang sound, which was actually another massive metal bar door that sealed the exit. The metal bars came out from the ground as well as from above the door as if they were claws coming out of Wolverine's fists. For sure, several mechanisms like this were now fully active once lockup time had commenced. In addition to that, the prison had several other escape-proof mechanisms too. If the prisoners actually attempted to escape, time passed by a little too slowly for some of the prisoners, as they had to force themselves not to sleep, while waiting for the faithful hour to approach. But the more they waited, the sleepier they became. Some literally had to slap themselves hard just to stay awake. After all, in addition to doing their regular day chores, they had also been painstakingly scrubbing the massive cafeteria floors, tables, chairs, and walls with just a toothbrush as well. So how could their bodies not feel tired? As for Tybalt, he calmly sat up on his bed and continued his countdown. With the place this dark, how else was he supposed to know the time? From the moment the announcement rang out stating that it was now 11 p.m., he had begun his countdown from there. Over this period of time, he had observed the wall clocks within the prison, 
and could now estimate how long it would take for every second and minute to pass them by. All he knew was that at exactly 12.30 midnight, he would finally make his move. He sat for a while at the edge of his bed and fully concentrated on doing his job. Time was once again AB asterisk TCH, as it really moved too slow for these prisoners. 57, 58, 59, 60. Tybalt said while counting down the past few seconds left. Once Tybalt stood up from his bed, his roommate also did the same as well. Tybalt, is it time? Yeah, it's time. Now, let's go. Cat Jack. Tybalt opened the door as quietly as he could, but of course, those around his cell still heard the noise or the heavy cell door opening. Some of them who were in on the escape plan hurriedly got up from their beds and waited for Tybalt to open their cells, while others who had no idea of what was actually going on were so shocked that they soon became speechless. Their blood boiled as they looked at their own colleague who was now out of his cell just like that. This, this, this really was shocking. For a moment, they truly felt like they were still dreaming. Damn it. If it was actually this easy to escape, then why didn't they try? The man they were now looking at also had two hands, feet, eyes, and everything else that they had too. So if he could do it, then why couldn't they? Of course, they also thought of the probability of him being caught. But since the guards hadn't noticed him yet, then didn't that mean that his chances of escaping were actually quite high? The key point that they took notice of was the fact that if Tybalt succeeded today, then for sure, security would only get tighter them who were now left behind. Because the guards here will better their defenses and might also restrict so many things for them instead. Thinking about it now, if they didn't escape today alongside Tybalt, then wouldn't it be ten times harder to escape in future? F asterisk CK, there was no way about it. It seems like they wouldn't have to shamelessly beg to be included in the plan. Hey brother, how can you be so mean? Aren't we neighbors? Brother, remember when I last helped you scrub the toilets? Please let me go with you, all right? Eh, wait, are you going with those losers? So you would rather escape with them, rather than with me the 37th assassin in Arcadina? Brother, do you know who I am? I'm the 8th most powerful opinion master from Corona. So if you take me with you, I promise to swear loyalty to you till death. Oomph, what are you so high and mighty about? Do you think that you and your stupid gang will ever succeed in escaping from this prison grounds? Yes, K, you're just a dreamer. And since you did this whole ordeal without involving my snowy wolf gang, then don't expect me to escape with you when my gang and I make our own escape attempts too. Because the way I see it, it wouldn't be long before you get caught and brought back to your cell. Yeah, you all will be back. Tybalt paid no attention to all those who constantly seek him out for freedom. Some cursed him, while others looked at him as their savior instead. But what did it have to do with him? He stealthily walked towards the cells of his group members and opened their doors gently. Katchak, every member of his gang had now been let out of their cells. Well done, Tybalt, their leader said, before turning to the rest of the gang. It's probably pitch dark in some areas within the sector. So stay sharp and close by at all times. With that, he led the team and jogged forward towards the exit. Even though it was a lights-off mode in their sleeping quarters, the place wasn't pitch dark, as some dim bluish lights had been left on instead. This was so that people wouldn't fall when taking a piss in their cells, or even miss the hole and so on. The light in the place was very similar to moonlight instead. So for sure, they could still somewhat see where they were going. And since they didn't know how the other places within the sector would be illuminated, they just assumed that some places might actually be pitch dark instead. They ran behind their leader until they reached the exit door for their sleeping quarters, which now had very thick iron bars spread across it. Their leader immediately reached for the black metal box on the sides. He lifted the top part of the box, and immediately, a number pad was revealed. Aldwin, for the past few months, you were tasked to study this thing. And so far, you reported that this thing was some sort of code puncher for the doors to open up. In addition to that, you also said that we only have one try to make sure that it works, or else the alarms would go off. But before you punch anything in, I would just like to find out how sure you are about the actual code, as well as the number of tries. Leader, even though I didn't particularly know what they were punching in, I still decided to study the hand coordination of every guard who has ever used this thing. 
be it how their hands shifted left, right, upwards and downwards. I carefully observed how they moved their fingers and bodies when punching anything in. As for the number of tries it would take before the alarm went off, I had once witnessed a new guard accidentally punch in a wrong code, which immediately set off the alarm throughout the sector. Hmm. Looking at it now, since there are only numbers on the thing, that means that we have to punch the right number code, or else the alarm system will go off. In other words, we have only one shot for our freedom. And it all rests on your shoulders, Aldwin. So now, it's your time to prove your worth. Yes, leader. Aldwin answered confidently. He looked at the number pad before him and took a deep breath before punching in what he believed to be the code. Everyone else held their breath anxiously, as their hearts felt like it would leap out of their chests any moment from now. Just looking at Aldwin work made their nerves run rampant all the more. Anxiety and fear sat behind their eyes, as now, they were somewhat fearful of what would happen to them if the alarms went off. Bloody hell, what had they gotten themselves into? Should they just kill themselves now, than to have their warden do it for them? Within the span of these few seconds, they seemed to have aged even more, as they all felt like an entire decade had already passed them by, and just when doubt had almost completely overtaken their mind. The sounds of the iron door reeling back into the ground could be heard by all. Eh, what just happened? Did he actually do it? Ah? He, he did it. It's a miracle. They were saved. They looked at the door again and inked several times, just to be sure that it was open. Damn, how cool was their brother just now? What other prisoner could do what their brother had just done? Please. Their gang was the real deal. It was the tip dog within this hellhole. They looked at Aldwin in awe. Brother, you really did it. Yeah, brother, you were really awesome. Yes, bro. I always believed you could do it. Me too, bro. I never doubted you even for a second. All right, boys, keep it down. We don't have much time left, so let's move out. And remember, we don't know anything about the security from here on out. So be on your guard at all times. Their leader said sternly. With that, everyone nodded and followed stealthily behind him. As for those whose prison cells were facing the exit, Shock had completely overturned their minds. Their bodies trembled and their lips quivered excitedly, as they now felt like even they could make their own prison break sometime later on. And just like that, the prisoners now a serious case of escape fever. Yes, apart from freedom, many of them felt like escaping from Baymard's prison was an accomplishment that could boost one's reputation. Because even though it looked easy, they knew that they could only open that door if they too observed and memorized what the guards were typically punching in. In fact, the only security setups and measures that the prisoners had seen were all in their sleeping quarters. Because excluding the outer walls and sector exit doors, the security within the other parts in the sector only came on after lights out. So none of the prisoners knew what they would be in for when they left the sleeping quarters. With that said, anyone who can actually escape from here needed to be clever strong, and quick-witted. At least, that was what the prisoners had concluded about the place. So if Tybalt, Aldwin, and their gang actually managed to escape tonight, then their names would probably go down in history for the rest of the prisoners. It would be like escaping from Alcatraz back on Earth. Undoubtedly, the escaped prisoners would have their reputations boosted in a truly unfathomable way. And so just like that, everyone decided to secretly make their own escape plans as well. Because just like a stimulus, the effect of tonight's scheme had now created a wave of new criminals. Tybalt and his gang were now out of their sleeping quarters and had now found themselves running along the massive corridor that they were more than familiar with. Remember, men, in the daytime, there are no security measures placed within the sector. So now that it's nighttime, we have no idea what we are walking into. But I have a feeling that we will be able to handle whatever is thrown at us just fine. Their leader said while looking at the long winding hallway intensively, and unbeknownst to them, when they had crossed a certain spot, they had already triggered some sensors within the place. And before they knew it, several massive holes miraculously appeared on the floor. SH asterisk T. Trap doors. That's right, in a flash, several trap doors opened up on the floors, with each trap door occupying the entire width of the hallway. Slick. Ah. Several men had fallen down to heaven knows where, 
while screaming at the top of their lungs. And from the sound of their screams, it seemed like the way down was truly a long one. Or more still, it actually sounded like the men were spiraling down these trapdoors instead. And all those above could hear were their echoes that resounded around the entire hallway. Just where did these trapdoors lead to? Panic began to spread across the men like a cluster of sparks as it made their abdomen churn uncomfortably. Their thoughts were now all over the place, as their hearts kept hammering within their chests nonstop. What the hell was going on here? Help? Help me, brother. Help us. Some of the prisoners had held onto the sides of the trap doors when it opened up previously, and now, they were dangling there for their poor lives. Immediately, their comrades helped them up in a flash. In this sort of situation, the more people they had, the better their chances of survival. Everyone freeze. Their leader commanded while looking at the path before and around him. Why did the floor suddenly open up? He truly had no idea what sort of crazy place this prison was. If they wanted to keep moving forward, they would have to keep jumping over these trapdoors successfully. Yes, that was the only way forward. While the leader was deep in thought, some of his men thought about a different problem that they were now facing. Leader, what do we do now? Some of the men that fell had some of our tools on them. So what do we do now? We don't know this place well, so we might not even need those tools. So for now, let's keep pushing forward. And before we step ahead, from now on, we should test out if the floor is safe or not. Right? They answered in unison. Good. Now, Gregory, hand me your rope. And Jeffrey, ha. Huh? Before the leader could continue on, the floor beneath them started disappearing once more. Damn it. Previously, their only way forward was to jump over all trap doors. So if the spaces that they were supposed to leap to disappeared, then where were they supposed to jump or hold on to? The leader's eyes opened wide in shock. F asterisk CK. These people were really trying to push them to their early graves. Quickly, quickly, everyone, keep jumping forward until the floor stops disappearing. With that, everyone began jumping like crazy. Some people had Mother Luck smile upon them, as they had successfully leaped forward just in time before they fell victim to these trap doors. But of course, Mother Luck didn't smile at everyone, as some of them were slow to jump when the floor beneath moved. So these ones didn't make it forward, and instead, ended up falling into their trap doors below. As for others, they had successfully jumped forward, but now, the place that they had targeted actually opened up and became a trap door. For sure, this was the end of the road for them. Eh? No. Help me. The cries of the fallen were heard by all those that kept moving forward. But what could they do? This place had now undoubtedly turned into a battlefield. The men jumped with all their might, from one path to another, until they had finally reached a corner in the hallway, which led left. Leader, it looks like it's finally over. The floor has stopped opening up. One of the men commented while breathing in and out loudly. In fact, it wasn't just him, as many of the men were also breathing rapidly as well. They felt like they had just completed some utterly unpredictable exercise. Everyone, stay close. And this time, watch out for the floor below you. Yes, leader, everyone replied, while cautiously following behind their leader. And when they had jogged a certain distance, they soon heard something move. Eh, where was that noise coming from? Everyone's ears were now perked up, and they quickly scanned through the room to find out where the noise was coming from. What the hell? Were they actually seeing things? Leader, the wall in front and the wall behind us are closing in very fast. Tybalt exclaimed frantically, Oh my heavens, what do they do now? This was the first time that he was facing something like this. Where in the entire Pino continent would a wall just move on its own? As someone who walked in the darkness as an assassin, the walls never moved, all right? It was people who moved. But now, if the walls moved, how was he supposed to fight it? Because no matter how tough one was, the speed at which those walls were coming at them, as well as how heavy they looked, one could rightfully assume that they could easily squash human flesh in a heartbeat. So how could he not panic? Who in his right frame of mind would like to be sandwiched and squashed like a bug? The walls were closing in, and everyone was scared out of their wits. And without even waiting for their leader to issue a command, 
their survival mode settings were already on. Right now, they had one thought in mind, and that was to find an exit. They scanned through the hallway anxiously, while waiting also moving forward as well. Look, I see another hallway up ahead. But we have to get there before the wall in front of us completely passes that point, Aldwin said. And just like that, the men sprinted forward as if they were in a marathon. They ran like the wind and even found themselves pushing each other while running to safety. Of course, once again, more trap doors opened up while they were running. Son of A.B. Asterisk Tisich, couldn't they just give them a break for even a second? Ah! Once again, several men fell down into the rabbit hole, while others pushed forward and tried their best to avoid more traps. Plop! Some of the men had finally jumped into the hallway just in time. As for the rest, well, do bad. One couldn't be a winner all the time, right? From there, the game only got more difficult and threatening for them. This time, there was a huge boulder running towards them. And after that, they almost entered a den of wild hangles, passed through a room of fire, passed through another room that almost electrocuted them dry, another that sharp needles flying out of the walls from left and right, and finally stopped in the room filled with sleeping gas. As they all fell into a deep sleep, they all wondered about something very important which had been bugging their minds ever since they left their sleeping quarters. How come all along their journey, they had never seen the places that they even familiar with? Where was the cafeteria? Where was the laundry room? Where was the pathway that even led to the showers? They were just utterly confused when it came to this prison. But of course if they knew the truth about the matter, they would really puke out blood and die in the end. You see, it was more like this. From the moment lockdown began, large doors that looked similar to the walls, wide black off those familiar areas. In short, one could think of it as camouflage. And with that in kind, the men would only have to run along all the pathways presented to them. The funny thing was that they had been going around the same place without even knowing it. No, it was more like they just going around a maze because that was how these pathways had been designed. During nighttime, within Sector A, there were 200 different blocks or pathways within them. Some pathways would take you two stories straight up using a ladder, while others might make you slide down instead. But no matter what direction people went, they would never find the real exit, because the exit was also camouflaged as well. And just after one managed to block up the camouflage door with explosives, they would now be met with doors that were as thick and heavy as vault doors. And after that, they would come face to face with other deadly security measures instead. So anyway, this entire time, out of those 200 visible pathways, Tybalt and the rest had only explored eight pathways before they failed. The sensors all around the pathways made it a the more deadly, as there were still some things that they hadn't even triggered in the areas that they had passed through yet. As for those who fell into the trap doors, they were actually sent three floors underground into several cages and locked up here. Of course, they didn't fall straight down since that would kill them. Nope. They actually fell onto a large tube that spiraled all the way down onto the cages. And just so that prisoners didn't try to hold on to the sides, the tubes were lined with grease during lockdown. And in the morning, the tubes get cleaned using a self-washing system. In short, this prison was built to ensure that no one got out. Tybalt and the rest really struggled to make it through Pathway 9, but the sleeping gas there was just too high. They felt their eyelids grow heavy with every passing second, and without someone even mentioning it to them, they knew that they had woefully failed tonight's operations. At this point, they all shuddered when they thought about their futures. Warden Mitchin will definitely have their heads. Sigh. They felt like digging up a hole, killing themselves, and diving into the hole while holding a flower in their hands. But something told that even in death, that beastly warden of theirs wouldn't let them go. And so just like that, their little prison break adventure had finally come to an end. Landon looked at the report in his hands and smiled. Ah. Apparently, the prisoners had tried their first attempt in breaking out of prison. Well, even though this entire scenario could be considered a bad one, for Landon and his team, it was actually an amazing way to test out some of the prison's defense systems here, as well as keep the guards on their toes. They needed to be more careful when punching in security codes in future, and they also needed to constantly check if they had their master keys on them at all times. But what the prisoners didn't know 
was that since all prisoner doors could be opened automatically, that means that the control security room was also keeping check on the doors at all times. So when they saw several red lights flash above the open cells after lights out, they had already used their walkie-talkies to communicate with each other and verify if any guard had opened the cells. Of course, in addition to that, they had also contacted Landon as well, who told them to just let the prisoners try their luck. And in the end, these prisoners had only passed through eight passageways. In addition to that, the report he had stated that they thought that the prison itself was a mystical one whose hallways and doors change overnight. They couldn't find any room or place that even remotely resumed the regions that they typically visited during the day. It was like they were in a totally different building altogether. In short, they had a feeling that even if they had drawn a map of the place in the daytime, they wouldn't even have time to think or figure out where they were supposed to go to. Since the hallways didn't even give them a breather to begin with, one had to be fearful of trap doors, fire, wild animals, gases that put them to sleep, trapped pits which had thunder sparks that could fry, electrocute, rooms that grew smaller on their own, and so on. In short, one didn't have the time to be looking at a map while there, as even being absent minded from one's surrounding could just be their end. This morning, they found all the escaped prisoners in sorry states. And after searching them, they found so many stolen items from the clinic and even the laundry room as well. Well, Landon was really impressed by how patient and resourceful they had been. It was like seeing an old crime movie come to life. As expected of assassins and poison masters. Your Majesty, this is all we know about them from our own observation and hypothesis about the matter, said one of the head guards from the prison. At the moment, the warden was on a cruise trip with his family to Corona. So the head guards were the only ones that could handle this matter alongside Landon. Just thinking about how furious the warden would be when he got back made the guards feel pity for the culprits. Sigh. When the warden came back, they would be as good as dead. He thought. Of course he wasn't the only one who thought so. As even the crits lived in fear fact the warden might even strangle them to death when he feasted his eyes upon them later on. They had no idea that the warden was on vacation. So the more the warden stayed away, the more anxious and fearful their hearts became. Damn it. Why were they so unlucky? Your Majesty. We also believe that they only stole the master key yesterday morning. They created that whole incident just for that reason, and even injured one of our new guards in the process. Oh? Have they confessed or explained the whole matter to you all? No, Your Majesty. For now, they are still proving very difficult. And so far, our story is only 70% accurate, as we have been piecing in all the clues together. When we found out that they used a master key to unlock their cells, we had all guards search for their own keys immediately. And so far, all guards that were in duty still had their keys. So we called each guard that was off duty and also verified if they had their keys or not. And that's when we found out that the injured guard seemed to have lost his keys yesterday morning. During that chaotic incident. Good. Well done. For now, keep trying to get a detailed explanation from the culprits. Who knows, maybe there's something that we are missing. And it would never hurt to make sure that none of our own men had betrayed us just to free them. Also, try getting eyewitnesses to the whole thing too. There are bound to be more than two or three people who witnessed them trying to escape. So try to get as much info as possible. So that we too can better our own defenses as well. You and the men should take this entire incident as a learning experience. Yes, your majesty. I will do as you be commanded. The guard said confidently. All right. As for their punishment, we can only decide on it when the warden gets back. So I need you all to schedule a meeting. Involving all the head guards in the entire prison no matter their sector, as well as the wardens for both male and female prisons. Of course, you also need to add, myself, the Minister of Justice and Defense and all other leaders involved in this matter. By then, we will decide on if we should extend their time here in prison or just give them a harsher punishment for the time being. Eh, so your majesty, what you're saying is that in the meantime, we should just let them be. The head guard asked confusedly. If they did that, wouldn't these prisoners think that they won't get punished? HMHM, for now, treat those that might have been injured and keep a close eye on the rest. We can't punish them twice for a single crime. So it would be unwise to send them to a punishment room before later deciding on what their real punishment would be. 
Landon said while closing up the folder before him. He looked towards the direction of the prison and smiled slightly. Ah. It was never a dull day here in Baymart. After speaking with the head guard, Landon tapped his fingers on his table gently. Deep down, he knew that no matter how risky things seemed, some people would definitely choose to do things for the thrill alone. So he knew that this wasn't the last time that someone would try to break out of prison. Even with all the high-tech systems back on Earth, prisoners still broke out frequently. So what more of here? Human beings were made to evolve and rise above any challenges. So with time, even the criminals would get better and wiser. And the only way to help them here was to constantly raise up the difficulty level. Well, with this whole prison thing behind him, now he could finally focus on more important things. Currently, Landon and his secretary were driving towards District C. To be specific, they were heading towards the Ministry of Tourism. One should know that it was already the 17th of February, and the ski snowboarding resort had already become one of the most popular sites to visit in Baymart. It's been weeks since it launched in Baymart and has been ranked as the eighth most amazing place to visit in Baymart. Heck, it even overtook the Baymartian Motion Picture Studios and the Murder House of Mysteries that took the 13th and 37th spots on the list. Of course, the first place had always been Landon's Magical Palace for some reason. Anyway, within the resort, children had fun outdoor skiing, slating and snowboarding, as well as adults who loved driving the snowmobiles instead. Also, there were those that just lived the feeling of flying, especially when those ski lifts carried them up in the air from one point to another. In short, many of the tourists and Baymardians felt like doing these fun activities on a daily basis. In addition to that, many of them loved staying in those simple yet beautiful dome-shaped rooms in the resort. This alone had reminded many Baymardians about the beauty of camping and so on. And so, it quickly became a hot site for many people especially couples. As of now, these dome-shaped homes had already been booked from now till July so far. So that was how much in demand they were at. Bottom line, people found the whole place to truly be a breath of fresh air and wanted these sorts of outdoor activities more. With all that said, many positive reviews and pleas had been sent to the Ministry of Tourism for many more opportunities like that one. As for what Landon knew, even though the people didn't want to live the way they used to live, they still wanted those fun-filled adventurous times in the woods. Sure, they had the zoo, a botanical garden, the park, and several other places that showcase nature. But what they wanted was a place that would allow them to sleep outdoors in safety. Just like the resort. To be more specific, they wanted a scene that was similar to hiking or surviving in the woods. But the catch was that they wanted the place to be very safe. After all the deaths and animal attacks that used to happen around Shanks Road, it was totally understandable why they wouldn't want to go out hiking in such a forest. In short, no wife, husband, or even parent would want their child or loved one to be torn apart by wild animals. So they just wanted an outdoor area that they could camp with tents and sleep comfortably around. Of course, the place could have small animals like rabbits and so on, and maybe even deers and other friendly large animals, but no wild ones. And so with all that in mind, the Minister of Tourism, and well as the minister that overlooked everything concerning wildlife, plants, and the entire ecosystem, quickly made a detailed note of what people truly wanted and decided to send in their request to land in ASAP. One should know that even back on Earth, even though people were still surrounded by technology, they still loved the great outdoors too. So what more of these people? Sure, they really lived how they were currently living now but that didn't mean that they didn't want to go hiking or camping once or twice. In the end, for the people's sake, it was always best for them to have a blend of both worlds. Welcome your majesty. Welcome your majesty. Both ministers greeted in unison, alongside their secretaries as well. After greeting everyone, Landon calmly sang down and discussed happily with them, while waiting for the meeting to begin. And as the men talked, their secretaries on the other hand, hastily took out several documents and placed them on the table. In short, they were the ones readying the place for the meeting instead. Seven minutes went by just like that and soon, Landon's secretary rose up from his seat and indicated for the meeting to begin. Another 47 minutes went by again, with everyone looking at Landon with admiration. What a guy. 
He had already come up with the perfect solution to the problem and had even thought about cost, construction, and other major and minor details. Yet, here they were scratching their heads on what to create. Of course, His Majesty had already asked them if they had any suggestions, and in truth, they really didn't have any even though they had been brainstorming for a while now. Your Majesty, can, can it really be done? Minister Abe said excitedly. His heart fluttered a bit, and for a short moment, his mind became somewhat blank. Genius. He looked at the document before him and almost felt like kissing it repeatedly. If they could pull this off, this would undoubtedly give Baymard more income just from tourists alone. Because with His Majesty's plans and designs, even people who typically camped or sleep in the woods would still want to come over to taste this sort of adventure. Minister Abe looked at the documents and laughed stupidly. As for Minister Florian, he was also pleased as well. Landon looked at their faces and was satisfied with their happy expressions. Since they had agreed, then he would quickly give Tim the go-ahead to begin construction. It could take years for it to be completed, but overall, the place would definitely be worth the wait. And what was he going to build? Well, it was best to say that it would be a place that showcases all terrains on the planet. It was going to be an enclosed park, like Jurassic Park, but without the dinosaurs, of course, and it also wouldn't be that big too. In other words, some places might look like the desert, the other places might look like the jungle. He would even out quicksand, hidden temples and so on there for adventures to swing through vines, climb mountains and so on. This was going to be an enclosed park that would take several years to build. Anyway, this was the best he could do for the people. With wars and wild animals around the place, he couldn't just send them yo their deaths outdoors. As previously before his arrival, most hunters still lost their lives or got heavy injured. And the people didn't want to camp if it wasn't safe. So he had to create his own forest for them. Basically, he would just enclose a massive space and create this dream world for the people. Right now, Landon wanted to iron out everything that needed his concern in Baymart. Because soon, he would have to ready his men and leave for his mission. That's right. It was almost time for him to drive towards the north of Arcadina. And who was he going to save? He had no idea, but all this only made him all the more intrigued. Your Majesty, what do you think about these models? Hmm, let's see. Landon said while inspecting the track before him. Of course, it was a military transport truck. With the date for his mission closing in, he had to ensure that everything was up to par. How many truck types have you all been able to make? Landon asked. As for who he was talking to, of course it was none other than Overseer Reagan from the weapon manufacturing industry. Reagan calmly adjusted his new medical-grade glasses before finally responding to Landon. Your Majesty, currently, only five types of transport trucks have been made from all the rest, as requested, Reagan said before giving Landon a document to look over. When he was assigned this task, his Majesty had said that he specifically wanted them to start creating these ones first before doing the rest on the list. Landon looked at the list while listening to Reagan. All trucks that they had created so far were fully covered, with none having an open boot, which was exactly what he was going for. He needed transport trucks that could focus on transporting humans, military weapons, food and so on during this winter season. Hence these sorts of transport trucks were perfect for the job as they were all fully covered with thick hard metal armor that was supposed to keep people safe against bullets, arrows, and so on. But even though the exterior looked so hard and tough, Landon had immediately designed the inside to be extremely comfortable for the soldiers who were ready or returning from combat, as well as those that they rescued or saved. Some of these trucks were made just for rescued personnel, so their insides were designed to resemble that of homes. In this way, those rescued would feel comfortable throughout their journey. In short, Landon had designed the inside to be like those overnight capsule hotel buses, which just had individual sleeping pods for its guests. Each pod or capsule had its own bed, pillow, and even its own curtain for privacy. And in addition to that, each pod had its own light bulb within its space, as well as some reading materials, like a Baymardian welcome book which showed all the fun things to do in Baymard with pictures included. This was definitely an amazing way to advertise Baymard's touristic side to those that hadn't seen the place before. That wasn't the only available thing to look at, as they would also have the Baymardian Bible, alongside some common storybooks, in their sleeping quarters as well. 
One never knew if it was a child that they were rescuing, or even the elderly, so it was always best to keep several options there at all times. These books were kept and secured on a built-in shelf on the walls, so they wouldn't fall during the journey. Of course, apart from reading material, there would also be water, as well as some other beverage and snacks in their pods when they first get in. And during the course of the journey, they would get at least two square meals a day, since one of the military trucks was just an entire built-in kitchen. With how fast they had to travel, they weren't going to keep stopping every now and then just for cooking or meals. And what if it was snowing heavily for several days in a row? Were they going to starve just because of that? Indeed, that just seemed too ridiculous to land in. So rather than that, it was better to make a kitchen that was tremor-proof on the road, alongside several fridges and freezers. It would definitely be best to make some dishes and keep on the side for a day or two, so that the cooks would also have some time off as well. They could properly store it well like how airplanes store their foods. And when it would be breakfast or any other meal time, they would just preheat the food before sending it over to the soldiers as well as the guests. They would definitely stop the trucks for meal distribution, but it wasn't going to take over even up to 10 minutes. Because rather than cooking outside for more than an hour for the large group of soldiers and guests, 10 minutes was definitely the better option at the moment. And after meal distribution, they could eat in the vehicles while continuing their journey towards their final destination. Your Majesty, last but not least, we have the clinical trucks here. They were the trickiest to do, but eventually, we got it through in the end, Reagan said while opening the truck door for Landon. One should know that at least four or seven military doctors and nurses would be coming on this trip as well. So Landon had made many clinics in some of the trucks as well. In this way, when they got to the battlefield and did their part, after the battle, the back of the trucks could open up and immediately transform into a clinic that would have all the injured men gathered around it. There should also be stretchers and even important tools for doing some major and minor operations. For example, if one were to get stabbed with a wooden stake or get shot with a bullet, the doctors were expected to remove the foreign objects like the bullet or wooden pieces and immediately treat the patient, as well as stick up the injuries. Any delay might lead to loss of life so it was best for them to save time by having all the equipment organized and ready to go. In short, Landon had really thought of everything. Of course, these trucks were marvelous for off-road travels as well. Right now, all he was focused on was getting to the north of Arcadena on time, so he needed something that could do the job effortlessly, while still making everyone feel as comfortable as possible. They would be on the road for several days in a row, so there was no need in making them sleep upright. That would just give them stiff necks and other complications. Landon inspected all truck types and nodded in satisfaction. Chief Reagan, I'm impressed. Landon smiled in satisfaction as he looked at the vehicles before him. With these trucks, he and the men would definitely be able to make it on time for the rescue mission. As for as many trucks he was going to leave with, well, he had decided to take a total of 40, which would include three kitchen trucks, five clinical trucks, five guest carrying trucks, 24 trucks for transporting soldiers, and three more for transporting weapons, storing raw bags of grain or food, spare tires, blankets, and any other items that might be of some use to the mission. One should know that the trucks carrying the guests were made to be fancier, as it was more spacious and gave room for privacy. But the ones carrying the soldiers had smaller beds and no privacy. The interior of these trucks looked like a dormitory, with several beds bunked onto of one another. For sure, even though the guest capsules were also bunked, because they were spacious and had their own privacy, it actually gave off a very sophisticated look. But these ones on the other hand, looked very crude in regards to those in the guest trucks. And that was because the soldiers needed to stay alert at all times. Unlike the guests, the soldiers had to be ready for action in a flash. So capsules or pos would definitely be a hinder to them if they have to jump off their beds hurriedly. And they also had to have their eyes visible to their entire surroundings at all times as well. So privacy was definitely not an option for them. There were beds spread all across the walls of these trucks, and each column had at least three rows of beds that were bunked on top of one another. In short, every space within the truck had been maximized to the fullest, because the beds here were all foldable. Of course, Landon had taken this concept from Earth. It was the same concept used for foldable parlor or dining room chairs that were attached to the walls. 
When they were not needed, they would fold up, creating for space in the living too and vice versa. Likewise, the beds for these soldiers could be hidden away in order to create more space for any emergencies or inconveniences. Also, there were several roll-up camping bags available, just in case some people chose to sleep on the floors instead. Anyway, Landon had no doubt that this number of trucks would be enough for the mission. And even though he would have definitely loved to use the new military tanks for this mission, traveling with it out of Baymard would make their journey relatively slow, so he couldn't. In addition to that, now wasn't the right time to show off those tanks yet, as he still needed to use them to deal with that scum father of his. From the tracker that he put on him, it showed that Alec was already on his way to Baymard and would only arrive sometime during spring. The funny thing was that Landon would leave Baymard, drive go the north, and still come back way before Alec attacked. Ah. Uh. Modern cars were definitely faster than horses. And taking into account that Alec would definitely use wagons to transport some of his weapons under this harsh climate, Landon already knew that Alec could only arrive here during late spring. With that in mind, since he knew what route Alec was taking, he decided to use another route. When going to and from the north, your majesty, you, you like them? HMHM, they're all what I expected. Good job, Reagan. Thank you, your majesty. All right, since it's now completed, send the trucks that I've selected to the barracks immediately, Landon said while touching the sturdy exterior of one of the trucks. As for the new weapons like time bombs and smoke bombs, those ones had already been created a while back. So he had already sent out his request for what he needed for this mission. And of course, his request had already been approved by the military board. Yes. Even he had to get approval for resources since everything needed to be properly documented at all times. All right, Reagan, keep up the good work. Yes, your majesty. Reagan replied while adjusting his glasses again. With that, Landon left Reagan and calmly made his way towards the food industry. Everything concerning his mission was now set and ready to go as even the doctors and soldiers that needed to accompany him on the trip had also been chosen and briefed on their mission too. Of course budgeting for provisions, surgical tools, blankets, and other items had also been approved as well. So all that was left was for him to wait for his departure day. But while all that was going on, a certain lover boy had finally arrived at the shores of Corona. The shores of Lapland Coastal City, the Empire of Corona. A young handsome man stood majestically on one of the balconies in his ship. He listened to the sounds of the ocean, hitting against his ship, as well as the rowdy noises coming from the shores that could be heard from a mile away. He squinted his eyes and gave off a confident smile. Men, ready the sails and pull up our flag. I want these lowlifes to know just how rich we are. Yes, your highness. His men tried proudly. Good. Now. Also get all those glass pieces that had been created by heavenly lightning that stroke our city back in the empire. Yes, K. I'm sure that these lowlives haven't seen glass before. So if we give some chards of glass out to them, then they would definitely worship us all the more. Your highness is wise. These wild people would definitely fall in love with his highness even more, said a large burly man with an evil grin on his face. How hard was it to win over Bushmen? As for their leader, he just smiled proudly at them, before looking at the shores of Lapland City again. My dear sweet Penelope, the love of your life is finally here. Prince Skye looked at the shores of Corona gleefully. Has anyone ever been able to resist the temptation of owning glass? If he distributed small shards of glass to these savages, then wouldn't they be thankful to him all the more? After all, since glass was so expensive, it would mean that they could trade it in for more money or even keep it as a family heirloom. But what Prince Sky didn't know was that thanks to some of Baymard's goods that were sold in glass objects, no one really thought much of glass anymore, as now even peasants had too. Of course, all of this was in the future. But for now, Prince Sky thought that his plan was as solid as a rock. In fact, even without any plan, he still felt like he, Prince Sky Williams, would definitely be successful in wooing Penelope. After all, most women typically jumped all over the place whenever they heard that he was from the continent of Venita. So what more of her? A woman was a woman, no matter how he saw it. They were loose, fickle, greedy, 
selfish, and scheming, with their only purpose in life being to hook the biggest fish in the sea. And since he was indeed the biggest fish at the moment, so how could Penelope dare to refuse his proposal? No, that would just defy natural common sense. And such a smart woman like herself would definitely have such common sense. Sky and his crew soon drew closer to the port on the shores, alongside several other ships. And as they moved, even though those beside them saw their flags, no one even slowed down or gave them away. In short, it wasn't that these people were being rude to them. No, rather than being rude, one could say that they were just in a hast, as time was now against them. In fact, many people didn't even have the time to look at Sky's hoisted flag properly. You see, this was Lopland City. This was the city where the Bakeronian ships were and so many people had sailed from different continents to Corona, just for the experience. They had the pamphlets that showed the ship's departure and arrival times. So if they didn't hurry to book earlier, then wouldn't the entire ship be booked full? By then, wouldn't they have to wait for another ship before they depart? And worse, if they don't hurry up and miss their booking in time, then wouldn't they have missed their ship ride just like that? At first, several aristocrats and nobles took their time to dock and even head on out to the Bakeronian ship station. But after missing their ships for several times in a row, they soon understood the essence of timekeeping. They now hurried the men carrying their bags and ran behind them as fast as they could towards the ship station. In fact, they acted as if they were about to miss their airplane flight or something. Because for sure, even when these people missed their ship rides, they felt the same way those on Earth felt when they missed their flight in the airports. No one liked waiting in the ship station for the next ship or even sleeping in the town an extra day if they didn't plan to do so. So it wasn't that these people were being disrespectful to Skye and his men. No, it was just that they were truly in a rush to even register what flag had been hoisted. Skye and his men looked at the surrounding ships in confusion and anger. On the surrounding ships, everyone was running around crazily as if their lives depended on it. Can you guys just hurry up? Children, please don't bother the men who are trying to work. If you do so, then I won't allow any of Hanyo get ice cream when we get on board the ship. Kome. Bring all the luggage and place them here immediately. Oh my god, can you all be fast? Tell those below to row the ship as fast as they can. We don't have all day here, so tell them to row faster. Conversations like these could be heard all around them. These people even held their pieces of luggage and stood by the exit of their ships as if they wanted to dive into the water while holding their luggage. And why the hell were they shaking so much and tapping their feet so impatiently? In short, the entire scene was really chaotic. And all of this just made Sky and his crew truly feel annoyed when they looked at the savages around them. The smiles that they had previously worn had now turned upside down the more they observed. Typically, when their flag was hoisted, several ships usually stopped anchor just to let them pass. In short, everyone usually made way for them while slightly bowing on them. But rather than having this sort of treatment, those around them increased their speed as well, as if they were in some racing competition with them. And the funny thing was that these people had great incredible ship docking skills. Sky and his men had been targeting a certain docking spot once they realized that the ship on that spot was trying to leave. But before they knew it, someone had already overtaken them and hastily rushed in the spot in a flash. In fact, even the speed at which everything was prepared was shocking. Once the ship docked, the wooden bridge that allowed passengers to step down was quickly placed at lightning speed, and those on board ran down with their luggage like crazy. In fact, to Sky and his men, they were so rude that these spit stealers didn't even bother to look at the people that they had stolen the spot from. How disrespectful. Sky and his men were now boiling in rage. So much so that their faces had turned red as a tomato. Good. These people were indeed savages. Bam. Your Highness. These people are clearly not putting you in their eyes. Just who the hell did they think they were? Your Highness. They already took the last available spot. So now, do they really expect us to drop anchor and sail out in small boats to their port? How preposterous. Your Highness, I think that we shouldn't give them any more glass shards again. Many of the men complained to their heart's content until someone quickly spotted some empty spots at the far end of the shores. 
Your Highness, I think I see several spots, but on the massive signboard there, it says that they all say that they're all reserved for something called the Bakeronian Station, said Quasi, who was a tall, burly man with a ghastly scar on his face. Your Highness, what Quasi said makes sense. But looking at it now, the massive ships on this dock show that we can't afford to offend the owner of the place anytime soon. So maybe it will be better for us to anchor out instead. Pui, can you listen to yourself? Do you want His Highness to act like a peasant? Are you even thinking properly? Hmph. Don't mind him. I've always known that he was a fool. Because if not, then how would he suggest that His Highness should stoop so low in a foreign land? Wouldn't that just damage His Highness prestige all the more? And how are you even sure that those are ships? Yeah. How can any ship be made of metal and float? I reckon that those are buildings that have been designed to look like ships instead. Wait a moment, guys. I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense. But wouldn't it be stupid to just make a metal building and put it in water like that? Wouldn't it rust? And even if it was truly a building, then how did they manage to make it underwater? So it might actually be a ship? That's impossible. It's a building. The men debated for a while, before Sky finally raised his right hand up and called for silence. He squinted his eyes and looked at the massive, terrifying ship greedily. Men, whether it's a ship or a building, we will definitely know for sure when we take a user look, but I can assure you all that it is indeed a ship, and from the look of it, its owner is surely a rich one too. So it's safe to say that the owner would have some major forces here in Corona. With that said, if we befriend such a man, our mission here will be an easy one for sure. And who knows? Maybe the owner might even give us one of these magnificent ships if he finds out about our identities. Sky said while massaging his chin mischievously. As for his men, listening to their leader made them completely speechless in an instant. Even though some of them suspected that those structures were truly ships, the realization of it all truly hit them hard. Since they had never seen a ship like this, their legs instantly went weak from shock, and their hearts tightened up a bit too. Did these people perform sorcery when creating these ships? So your highness, you're saying that we should dock our ships over there? Quasi asked. HMHM. But your highness, the place is still reserved. So wouldn't the owner be angry with us for doing so? If we really dock there, then how would we get on the owner's good side? Asked another man. Sky looked at the dock and sneered. Reserved? Hee hee. Who could be more important than us? Any smart man who sees our flag and symbol would definitely run over to curry favor with us. We have a lot more to offer these people than anyone else in the Pino continent. So for sure, the owner of this place wouldn't be mad. No, he would be overly welcoming instead, because there is not a single influential person around that doesn't know the benefits and power that people from the continent of Veneta wield. So can such a person dare to go against them? In addition to that, the fact that I'm also a prince guarantees our safety all the more because no one would dare touch me for fear of a full-scale war from our people. With that said, who cares if the place is reserved or not? Right now, we have now claimed it as our one, and I would like to see who can stop us from docking there, Sky said arrogantly. As for his men, they also raised their chests slightly higher than average while also looking at the dock arrogantly as well. His Highness was right. Who could stop them here? No one that's who. They sailed towards the ship station majestically, and before they knew it, they were now extremely close to the massive heavenly ship. Beautiful, they thought. The ship was really a beauty, and was much bigger than they had anticipated it to be at a distance away. But while they were still admiring its beauty, three metal ships that were about the same size as their own ships speedily made way towards them. They hastily wiped their eyes with their hands, while focusing on these ships in a daze. How could metal ships go so fast? Were the men paddling in these ships even human? And more importantly, shouldn't a floating metal ship be breaking some sort of mystical law or something? Sky's eyes went back and forth between his own ships and the metal ships for a while, as if trying to compare the two and find out which one was the better option. And soon, his eyes finally settled with immense greed. As he looked at these metal ships before him, no matter what, he had to get his hands on at least one, two, or three of those ships. Halt! 
This entire dock is reserved and is only meant to be used by the ship station. So please, leave now and find space in the other dock. I repeat, this entire place is already reserved. So please leave now. Do you like this video? Let me know by giving it a thumbs up and leaving a comment below. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell to stay updated on my future uploads.